Today's opera in our series of complete performances of the operas of Gilbert and Sullivan is the Ye operas of Gilbert and Sullivan is the Yeoman of the Guard or the Merriman and his Maid.
today, our setting is the Tower of London in the days of the Tudors. And we go, first of all, to Tower Green, where we find Phoebe Merrill, whose father is a sergeant yeoman, seated at her spinning wheel in the sunshine. Miss Merrill. Oh. oh, it's you, is it, Master Shadbolt? You may go away if you like, because I don't want you, you know. Haven't you anything to say to me? Oh, yes. Are the birds all caged? The wild beasts all littered down? All the locks, chains, bolts and bars in good order? Is the little ease sufficiently uncomfortable? The racks, pincers, thumbscrews all ready for work? Oh, you brute! These allusions to my professional duties are in doubtful taste. I didn't become a head jailer because I like head jailing. I didn't become an assistant tormentor because I like assistant tormenting. We can't all be sorcerers, you know. Oh. Ah, you brought that upon yourself. Colonel Fairfax is not a sorcerer. He's a man of science and an alchemist. Well, whatever he is, he won't be one long. For he's to be beheaded today for dealings with the devil. 
His master nearly had him last night when the fire broke out in the Beecham Tower. Oh, how I wish he'd escaped in the confusion. But take care. There's still time for reply to his petition for mercy. Well, I'm content to chance that. This evening at half past seven... Oh, you're a cruel monster to speak so unfeelingly of the death of a young and handsome soldier. Young and handsome? How do you know he's young and handsome? Because I've seen him every day for weeks past taking his exercise on the Beecham Tower. Curse him. There! I believe you're jealous of him now. Jealous of a man I've never spoken to. Jealous of a poor soul who's to die in an hour. I am. I'm jealous of everybody and everything. I'm jealous of the very words I speak to you because they reach your ears and I mustn't go near them. How unjust you are. Jealous of the words you speak to me. Why, you know as well as I do that I don't even like them. You used to like them. I used to pretend I liked them. It was mere politeness to comparative strangers. I don't believe you know what jealousy is. I don't believe you know how it eats into a man's heart and disorders his digestion and turns his interior into boiling lead. Oh, you are a heartless jade to trifle with the delicate organisation of the human interior. <laughs> Oh! 
day to you, Corporal. Good day, Dame Carruthers. Busy today? Busy, aye. The fire in the Beecham last night has given me work enough. A dozen poor prisoners. Richard Colfax, Sir Martin Byfleet, Colonel Fairfax, Warren the Preacher Poet, and a half a score others all packed into one small cell not six feet square. Poor Colonel Fairfax, who's to die today, is to be removed to number 14 in the Cold Harbour Tower, that he may have his last hour alone with his confessor, and I've to see to that. Poor gentleman, he'll die bravely. I fought under him two years since, and he valued his life as it were a feather. He's the bravest, the handsomest, and the best young gentleman in England. He twice saved my father's life, and it's a cruel thing, a wicked thing, and a barbarous thing that so gallant a hero should lose his head, for it's the handsomest head in England. What dealings with the devil? Aye, if all were beheaded who dealt with him, there'd be busy doings on Tower Green. You know very well that Colonel Fairfax is a student of alchemy, nothing more and nothing less. But this wicked tower, like a cruel giant in a fairy tale, must be fed with blood. And that blood must be the best and bravest in England, or it's not good enough for the old blunderbore. Ooh. Silence, you silly girl. You know not what you say. I was born in the old keep, and I've grown grey in it. And please God, I shall die and be buried in it. And there's not a stone in its walls that is not as dear to me as my own right hand. <laughs> Oh, 
reprieve arrive for the poor gentleman? No, my lass. But there's one hope yet. Thy brother Leonard, who was a reward for his valour in saving his standard and cutting his way through fifty foes who would have hanged him, has been appointed a yeoman of the guard. He will arrive this morning. And as he comes straight from Windsor where the court is, it may be, it may be, that he will bring the expected reprieve with him. Oh, that he may. Amen to that. For the colonel twice saved my life, and I'd give the rest of my life to save his. And wilt thou not be glad to welcome thy brave brother with the fame of whose exploits all England is a-ringing? Aye, truly, if he brings the reprieve. And not otherwise. Well, he's a brave fellow indeed, and I love brave men. All brave men? <laughs> Most of them, I verily believe. But I hope Leonard will not be too strict with me. They say he's a very dragon of virtue and circumspection. <laughs> now, my dear old father is kindness itself. And, and leaves thee pretty well to thine own ways, eh? <laughs> well, I've no fears for thee. Thou hast a feather brain, but that a good lass. Yes, that's all very well, but if Leonard is going to tell me that I may not do this and I may not do that, and I must not talk to this one or walk with that one, but go through the world with my lips pursed up and my eyes cast down like a poor nun who's renounced mankind, why, as I have not renounced mankind and don't mean to renounce mankind, I won't have it. There. Nay, he'll not check thee more than is good for thee, Phoebe. Father! Ha-ha! <laughs> Father! Leonard! <laughs> my brave boy. I'm right glad to see thee, and so is Phoebe. Aye, hast thou brought Colonel Fairfax's reprieve? Nay, Phoebe. I have here a dispatch for the lieutenant, but no reprieve for the colonel. Poor gentleman, poor gentleman. Aye, I would I had brought better news. I'd give my right hand, nay, my body, my life to save his. Dost thou speak in earnest, my lad? Aye, father, I am no braggart. Did he not save thy life? And am I not his foster brother? Then hearken to me. Thou hast come to join the yeoman of the guard. Well? None has seen thee but ourselves. And a sentry who took but scant notice of me. Now to prove thy words. Give me the dispatch and get thee hence at once. Here's money, and I'll send thee more. Now lie hidden for a space... And let no one know. I'll convey a suit of yeoman's uniform to the colonel's cell. He shall shave off his beard so that none shall know him. And I'll own him as my son, the brave Leonard Merrill, who saved his flag and cut his way through fifty foes who thirsted for his life. He will be welcomed without question by my brother yeoman, I'll warrant that. <laughs> now, how to get access to his cell? Phoebe! The key is with thy sour-faced admirer, Wilfred Shadbolt. I think, I say I think, I can get anything I want from Wilfred. I think, I say I think, you may leave that to me. Then get thee hence at once, lad, and bless thee for this sacrifice. And take my blessing too, dear, dear Leonard. And thine, eh? <laughs> thy love is newborn. Wrap it up, lest it take cold and die. <laughs> Angel hangs upon the deed. Dark angel hangs upon the deed. A scheme is rash and well may fail, but ours are not the hearts that quail, the hands that shrink, the cheeks that fail in hours of need. No, ours are not the hearts that quail, the hands that shrink, the cheeks that fail.
Alas, be of good cheer. We may save him yet. Oh, see, Father. They bring the poor gentleman from the beach. And... Oh, Father, his hour is not yet come. No, no, no. They lead him to the cold harbor tower to await his end in solitude. But softly, the lieutenant approaches. He should not see thee weak. Hold! Colonel Fairfax, my old friend, we meet but sadly. Sir, I greet you with all goodwill. And I thank you for the zealous care with which you have guarded me from the pestilent dangers which threaten human life outside. In this happy little community, death, when he comes, doth so in punctual and businesslike fashion, and like a courtly gentleman, giveth due notice of his advent that one may not be taken unawares. Sir, you bear this bravely, as a brave man should. Why, sir, it is no light boon to die swiftly and surely at a given hour and in a given fashion. Truth to tell, I would gladly have my life, but if that may not be, I have the next best thing to it, which is death. Believe me, sir, my lot is not so much amiss. Oh, father, father, I cannot bear it. My poor lass. Nay, pretty one, why weepest thou? Come, be comforted. Such a life as mine is not worth weeping for. Sergeant Merrill, is it not? Colonel. May I greet my old friend? Of course. Why, man, what's all this? Thou and I have faced the grim old king a dozen times, and never has his majesty come to me in such goodly fashion. Keep us stout heart, good fellow. We are soldiers, and we know how to die, thou and I. Take my word for it. It is easier to die well than to live well. For in sooth, I have tried both. A boon, if so, it must befall that death, when he call, must call too soon. Though four score years he give, yet one would pray to live another moon. What kind of plaint have I? in July, who oh, perish in July. I might have had to die, perchance in June. I might have had to die, perchance in June. Then count it not a quit. Nay, count it not a quit. Man is well done with it. Soon as he's born, he should on a means essay to put the plague away. And I go on to catch the fugitive. My life most gladly give. I might have had to live another on. I might have had to live to live another. And now, Sir Richard, I have a boon to beg. I am in this strait for no better reason than because my kinsman, Sir Clarence Potwistle, one of the secretaries of state, has charged me with sorcery in order that he may succeed to my estate, which devolves to him, provided I die unmarried. As thou wilt most surely do. Nay, as I will most surely not do. Mm -hmm. By your worship's grace. I have a mind to thwart this good cousin of mine. Ah. By marrying forthwith, to be sure. 
But heaven have mercy, whom wouldst thou marry? <laughs> Nay, I am indifferent on that score. Coming death hath made of me a true and chivalrous knight, who holds all womankind in such esteem that the oldest and the meanest and the worst favoured of them is good enough for him. So, my good lieutenant, if thou would serve a poor soldier who has but an hour to live, find me the first that comes. My confessor shall marry us, and her dower shall be my dishonoured name and a hundred crowns to boot. No such poor dower for an hour of matrimony. Strange request. I doubt that I should be warranted in granting it. Tut, tut. There never was a marriage fraught with so little of evil to the contracting parties. In an hour, she'll be a widow, and I... a bachelor again, for aught I know. Well, I will see what can be done, for I hold thy kinsman in abhorrence for the scurvy trick he has played thee. A thousand thanks, good sir. We meet again on this spot in an hour or so. I shall be a bridegroom then, and uh, your worship will wish me joy. Till then, farewell. I'm ready, good fellows. He is a brave fellow, and it is a pity that he should die. Now, how to find him a bride at such short notice? Well, the task should be easy. Satisfy you, for we are merry folk would make all merry as ourselves. For look you, there is humour in all things, and the truest philosophy is that which teaches us to find it and to make the most of it. Hands off, say a manly fellow. Aha, didst thou hear her say hands off? I, I heard her say it, and I felt her do it. What then? Thou dost not see the humour of that. Nay, if I do hang me. Thou dost not now observe. She said, hands off, whose hands, thine, of whom, of her, why? Because she is a woman. Now, had she not been a woman, thine hands had not been set upon her at all. So the reason for the laying on of hands is the reason for the taking off of hands. And herein is contradiction contradicted. It is the very marriage of pro with con. And no such lopsided union either as times go, for pro is not more unlike con than man is unlike woman. Yet men and women marry every day with none to say, oh, the pity of it. But I and fools like me. <laughs> now, wherewithal shall we please you? We can rhyme you, couplet, trilet, quatrain, sonnet, rondelet, ballad, what you will. Or we can dance you, saraband, gondolet, carol, pimpernel, or jumping joan. Let us give them the singing farce of the merriman and his maid. Therein is song and dance, too. <laughs> I have a song to sing, oh. Sing me a song. It is sung to the moon by a lovelorn loon who fled from the mocking throng, oh. It's a song of a merry man moping bum whose soul was sad and whose glance was glum, who sipped no sup and who craved no crumb as he sighed for the love of a lady. Misery me, lack a lady. He sipped no sap and he craved no crumbs. He sighed for the love of a lady. I have a song to sing. Oh. What is your song? Oh? It is sung with the ring of the songs they sing. Who oh, love with a love like long. Oh. It's the song of a merry maid, fairly proud, who loved the Lord and who laughed aloud at the Mum, whose soul was sad and whose glance was glum, who sipped no sap and 
Have a song to sing, oh. Sing me a song. It is sung to the knell of a churchyard bell and a doleful urge ding dong. Oh, it's a song of a puppy jay bravely born who turned up his noble nose with scorn at the humble merry maid, purely proud, who loved the Lord and who laughed aloud at the moan of the merry man, moping bum. Whose soul was sad and whose glance was glum, who sipped no supper, who craved no crumb as he sighed for the love of a lady. Lady, lady, misery me, black and lady. He sipped no supper, he craved no crumb as he sighed for the love of a lady. I have a song to sing. Oh. Sing me a song. Oh. With a sigh and a tear in the eye, for it tells of a right and a wrong. It's the song of a merry maid once so gay, who turned on a heel and tripped away from the lake of Popinjay, bravely born, who turned up his noble nose with scorn at the humble heart that he did not prize. So she begged on her knees with downcast eyes for the love of the merry man, moping mum, whose soul was sad and whose glance was glum. A kiss for that pretty maid. Aye, a kiss, a kiss all kiss round. round. Just beware, I'm armed. Back, sirs, back. This is going too far. Oh, thou dost not see the humour of it, eh? Yet there is humour in all things, even in this. <laughs> <laughs> what is this, Potter? Oh, oh, sir, we have sung to these folk, and they would have repaid us with gross courtesy, but for your honour's coming. Away with ye! Clear the rubble! Oh, no, oh, now, my girl, who are you and what do you here? May it please you, sir, we are two strolling players, Jack Point and I, Elsie Maynard, at your worship's service. Your worship. We go from fair to fair, singing and dancing, and playing brief interludes, and so we make a poor living. You too, eh? Uh, are ye man and wife? Uh, no, sir, for though I am a fool, there is a limit to my folly. Her mother, old Bridget Maynard, travels with us, for Elsie is a good girl. But the old woman is abed with fever, and we have come here to pick up some silver to buy an electuary for her. Harky, my girl, your mother is ill. Sorely ill, sir. And needs good food and many things that thou canst not buy. Alas, sir, it is too true. Wouldst thou earn an hundred crowns? An hundred crowns? They might save her life. Then listen. A worthy but unhappy gentleman is to be beheaded in an hour on this very spot. For sufficient reasons, he desires to marry before he dies, and he hath asked me to find him a wife. Wilt thou be that wife? The wife of a man I have never seen. Oh, why, sir, look you, I am concerned in this, for though I am not yet wedded to Elsie Maynard, time works wonders, and there is no knowing what may be in store for us. Have we your worship's word for it that this gentleman will die today? Nothing is more certain, I grieve to say. And that the maiden will be allowed to depart the very instant the ceremony is at an end? The very instant. I pledge my honour that it shall be so. An hundred crowns? An hundred crowns. For my part, I consent. It is for Elsie to speak. How say you, maiden, will you wed a man about to lose his head? And are you be a wife, and then the dar is yours for life. A headless bright wife refused. If truth the 
poet tell, most bright compare they marry, lose both head and heart as well. The general rule of life, I don't allow my promised wife, my lovely bride, that is to be to marry anyone but me. Yet if the fees promptly paid and he in well earned grave within the hour is duly laid, objection I will waive. Yes, objection I will weigh. Temptation to temptation will be, I pray, intended to shun what illustration of hallucination splendid. For oh, where there we do you, there the beginning in two. Lieutenant summons the head jailer Wilfred Shadbolt. Obeying whispered instructions, Shadbolt binds Elsie Maynard's eyes with a kerchief and leads her into the Cold Harbor Tower. And so, good fellow, you are a jester. Aye, sir, and like some of my jests, out of place. I have a vacancy for such an one. Uh, tell me, uh, what are your qualifications for such a post? Marry, sir, I have a pretty wit. I can rhyme you extempore. I can convulse you with quip and conundrum. I have the lighter philosophies at my tongue's tip. I can be merry, wise, quaint, grim, and sardonic. Mm. Uh, one by one or all at once. I have a pretty turn for anecdote. I know all the jests, ancient and modern, past, present, I can riddle you from dawn of day to set of sun, and if that content you not, well on to midnight and the small hours. <laughs> oh, sir, the pretty wit I warrant you, a pretty, pretty wit. <laughs> I jibe and joke, and quip and crank, for lowly folk and men of rank. I ply my craft, and know no fear, but aim my shaft at prince of fear, at fear or prince, at prince or fear. I aim my shaft and know no fear. Wisdom from the East and from the West, that's subject to no academic rule. You may find it in the cheering of a jest, or distill it from the folly of a fool. I can teach you with a quip if I've a mind. I can trick you into learning with a laugh. Oh, we know all my folly, 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 and you'll find a grain or two of truth among the top. Oh, we know all my folly, 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 and you'll find a grain or two of truth among the chaff. I can set a braggart quailing with a quip. The upstart I can wither with a whim. He may wear a merry laugh upon his lip. 
But his laughter has an echo that is grim When they're offered to the world in merry guise Unpleasant truths are swallowed with a will For he who'd make his fellow, fellow, fellow creatures wise Should always gild the philosophic pill For he who'd make his fellow, fellow, fellow creatures wise Should always gild the philosophic pill And how came you to leave your last employ? Why, sir, it was in this wise. My lord was the Archbishop of Canterbury, and it was considered that one of my dukes was unsuited to his grace's family circle. In truth, I ventured to ask a poor riddle, sir. Wherein lay the difference between his grace and poor Jack Point? His grace was pleased to give it up, sir. And thereupon I told him that whereas his grace was paid 10,000 a year for being good, a poor Jack Point was good for nothing. Hmm. It was but a harmless jest, but it offended his grace, who whipped me and set me in the stocks for a scurry rogue. And so we parted. I had as lief not take post again with the dignified clergy. But I trust you are very careful not to give offence. I have daughters. Sir, my jests are most carefully selected, and anything objectionable is expunged. If your honour pleases, I will try them first on your honour's chaplain. Oh, can you give me an example? Uh, say that I had sat me down hurriedly on something sharp. Sir, I should say that you had sat down on the spur of the moment. Mm hmm. I don't think much of that. Is that the best you can do? It has always been much admired, sir. But we will try again. Mm. Oh, well then, I am at dinner, and the joint of meat is but half cooked. Why, then, sir, I should say that what is underdone cannot be helped. I see. I think that manner of thing would be somewhat irritating. At first, sir, perhaps, but use is everything, and you would come in time to like it. We will suppose that um, I caught you kissing the kitchen wench under my very nose. Under her very nose, good sir, not under yours. That is where I would kiss her. <gasps> Do you take me, sir? Oh, sir, a pretty wit, a pretty, pretty wit. The maiden comes. Follow me, friend, and we will discuss this matter at length in my library. I am your worship's servant. Mm. That is to say, I trust I soon shall be. But before proceeding to a more serious topic, sir, can you tell me why a cook's brain pan is like an overwound clock? Ah, oh, truce to this fooling. Follow me. <laughs> Just my luck. My best conundrum. Wasted. Hey-ho, hey-ho. As Jack Point follows the lieutenant, Shadbolt leads Elsie Maynard out of a Cold Harbor tower and removing the kerchief from her eyes, leaves her alone on Tower Green. Oh, 
She's an odd freak for a dying man and his confessor to be closeted alone with a strange singing girl. I would fain have espied them, but they stopped up the keyhole. My keyhole! Now, what could he have wanted with her? That's what puzzles me. Wilfred, and alone. Now to get the keys from him. Wilfred, has no reprieve arrived? None. Thine adored Fairfax is to die. Nay, thou knowest that I have naught but pity for the poor condemned gentleman. I know that he who is about to die is more to thee than I, who am alive and well. Why, that were out of reason, dear Wilfred. Dear Wilfred? Do they not say that a live ass is better than a dead lion? Well, oh, no, I don't mean that. They say that, do they? It's unpardonably rude of them, but I believe they put it in that way. Not that it applies to thee, who art clever beyond all telling. Oh, yes, as an assistant tormentor. Nay, as a wit, as a humorist, as a most philosophic commentator on the vanity of human resolution. Truly, I have seen great resolution give way under my persuasive methods. In the nice regulation of a thumbscrew, oh, in the hundredth oh, part a of a single revolution, lies all the difference between stony reticence and a torrent of impulsive unbosoming that the pen can scarcely follow. <laughs> oh, I'm a mad wag. Thou art a most light-hearted and delightful companion, oh. Master Wilfred. Thine anecdotes of the torture chamber are the prettiest hearing. I'm a pleasant fellow when I choose. I believe I am the merriest dog that barks. Oh, we might be passing happy together. Perhaps, I do not know. For thou wouldst make a most tender and loving wife. Aye, to one whom I really loved. For there's a wealth of love within this little heart, saving up for I wonder whom. Now, of all the world of men, I wonder whom. To think that he, whom I am to wed, and is now alive, and, and somewhere, perhaps far away, perhaps close at hand, and I know him not. It seemeth that I am wasting time in not knowing him. Now, say that it is I. Nay, suppose it for the nonce. Say that we are wed. Suppose it only. Say that thou art my very bride, and I, thy cheery, joyous, bright, frolicsome husband, and that the day's work being done, and the prisoners stored away for the night, thou and I are alone together with a long, long evening before us. Mm, it's a pretty picture, but I scarcely know. It cometh so unexpectedly, and yet, and yet, were I thy bride? I wert thou my bride? Oh, how I would love thee!
thou art not, not yet. But, Lord, how she wooed. I should be no mean judge of wooing, seeing that I have been more hotly wooed than most men. I have been wooed by maid, widow, and wife. I have been wooed boldly, timidly, tearfully, shyly, by direct assault, by suggestion, by implication, by inference, and by innuendo. But this wooing is not of the common order. It is the wooing of one who must needs woo me, if she die for it. Aye, if she die for it. The deed is so far safely accomplished. The sly boots, how she wheedled him, even to replacing the keys. What a helpless ninny is a lovesick man. He's but as a lute in a woman's hands. She plays upon him whatever tune she will. But the colonel comes. If faith, he's just in time for the yeoman parade here for his execution in two minutes. My good and kind friend, thou runnest a grave risk for me. That's a no risk. I'll warrant none here will recognize you. You make a brave yeoman, sir. So, this ruff is too high. So, and your sword should hang thus. Here is your halberd, sir. Carry it thus. The yeoman come. Now remember... You are my brave son, Leonard Merrill. If I may not bear my own name, there is none other I would bear so readily. Now, sir, put a bold face on it, for they come. Didst 
the long to Leonard Merrill stand at last in last campaign, rescue it at deadly peril, bear it safely back again. Taken and depart from all escape, face with gallant heart unshaken, death in most appalling shape. Truly, I was to be pitied, having but an hour to live. I reluctantly submitted. I had no alternative. All oh, the tales that are narrated of my deeds of daring do have been much exaggerated, very much exaggerated. Scarce a word of them is true. Scarce a word of them is true. Brought to execution like a demigod of yore, with heroic resolution, snatched a sword and killed a score. Then a man in his head snatched a sword and killed a score. Then escaping from the foeman, bolted with the blood you shed, you defiant, dreading no man, saved your honor and your head. Then a man escaped his head, saved his honor and his head. True, my course with judgment shaping, favored too by lucky star. I succeeded in escaping prison vault and prison bar. All the tales that are narrated of my deeds of daring do have been much exaggerated, very much exaggerated. Scarce a word of them is true. Scarce a word of them is true.
to her an ever watchful guardian, eagle eyed. And when she feels, as sometimes she does feel, disposed to indiscriminate caress, be thou at hand to take those favors from her. Be thou at hand to take those favors from her.
my lord, I know not how to tell the news I bear. I and my comrades fought the prisoner's cell. Yes, woe is me, I rather think. Yes, woe is me, yes, woe is me, yes, woe is me, yes, woe is me, yes, woe is me. 